in the right room. Um, and and the note, the business track is going to move downstairs after this. So if you look at the Once the real crowd shows up. Exactly. But we thought he doesn't need a big room. Not many people are interested. In yeah, I have to don't, you don't have to tell me that, man. I, I get that. Um, I want to introduce you Mike Crossman. He's going to talk about compliance. You all know how boring compliance can be. It really Hopefully is terrible. Hopefully it's going to make it a little more interesting for us. I just found out uh, Mike is not on Twitter. Um, I hope all of you are. If you are not on Twitter, go to twitter.com and find the Source Boston feed. We have updates continuously this morning while uh, Richard Clark was talking. We updated constantly what's happening. And I'm sure Mike is going to get on. Thrashed. Very, very I quickly. Thrashed too. him, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, enjoy. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, Rafi. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for coming by. Um, you'll have to forgive me, but I'm, I'm going to go on a tirade for uh, a couple of minutes. Um, basically, because I can. Um, that's the first reason, is uh, basically because I can. Um, you know, first, there are a couple of things I'm pissed off about. Now, the first is Richard Clark. A wonderful, <laughs> you know, again, very senior guy. You know what? He stole my client seven joke. Right? That was the first thing I was going to do. He stole my joke, so I'm pissed off about that. Um, you, you know, second is, hey, I mean, listen, well, the guy's got a pretty good deal, right? You know, he spent a couple years in Washington. Now he goes around, he talks a little bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty good deal. He writes fiction. I mean, I, I'll tell you, I don't have interesting stories about being in the halls of justice uh, and that stuff. Uh, I don't write fiction, although if you read my newsletter, you may disagree with that. Uh, you don't know. So, yeah, interesting guy. Hard to follow uh, a, a dude like that. Um, and then finally, you, you know, and this is really a segue into the, into the uh, topic answer uh, here. Um, did everybody know that the answer is regulation? <laughs> the answer to all of our problems is regulation. If we would only get the ISPs to regulate what it is that we see, that would certainly protect us. And if we could get the government to define what a bunch of secure coding standards would be, life would be great. We'd have none of these problems. All of us would be out of a job. You buy that? Everybody buy that? I'm sitting there thinking I'm in the twilight zone here, right? You, you know, it just, again, it, it, it's amazing. Uh, one man's opinion, and you'll hear a lot about this over the next, you know, 45 to 50 minutes, uh, is compliance is not the thing to be thinking about. Compliance is a thing that you get by doing security well. We'll talk a lot about what that means, a lot about my philosophy, but it's really, to me, it's really a non sequitur to depend on some, you know, halls of justice to gain some kind of consensus that's going to protect the stuff that's important to us. I, I, you know, listen, I have a hard enough time getting my DSL line to be up, you know, pretty much every day. You know, EBDO, it's wonderful, you know, allows me to be nomadic, and most of the time the bandwidth just sucks. Maybe it's because everybody else is, you know, kind of doing the same uh, kind of thing. But the reality is I don't trust anybody to do much of anything. And that's why I'm a security professional, is that I'm borderline cynic. Uh, I happen to make, uh, you know, I, I practice that for a living now. Uh, and uh, I'm working on that with my shrink in terms of, you know, not trusting uh, anybody from that standpoint. So who am I? Why, why am I here? Uh, I, I like to kind of call what I do end user centric research on information security. So I'm not sitting here kind of parroting back what the vendors will tell you. Just go downstairs into the, uh, uh, into the showroom there and I'm sure they'll fill your mind up with all sorts of uh, interesting and very valuable uh, information. Uh, that's uh, important. You know, what I do is I, I kind of, I, I call it basically being a professional troublemaker or a rabble rouser. So I, I pretty much say whatever it is that I want. I write it, you know, three or four times a week because I don't care. I'm gonna tell you what I think because I can. Uh, so again, if you're looking for somebody to kind of parrot back things, that, that ain't me. Uh, Daily Insight is, is what I do. We'll talk a lot about my book called The Pragmatic CSO. The Pragmatic CSO was really born out of frustration. I talk to a lot of security professionals uh, every day, every week, uh, and it's hard. The job of being a security professional is very hard today. It's hard to prove relevance. It's hard to, you know, basically kind of validate what it is that we do for a daily basis. Nobody kind of understands why we're even there. They think we're a cost center, uh, and you know what happens, uh, especially in uh, a kind of challenging economic situation, you know, when people think you're a cost center. 
So we got to think about things a little bit differently. Ergo, the pragmatic CSO was born. So before I get into that, you know, I always like to kind of draw uh, a little bit of uh, a commonality with, with people uh, who are practitioners and you know, just kind of go through a day in the life of the typical person that I deal with. First thing you do is get up in the morning, have a couple of cups of coffee. Anybody not drink coffee here? What's the matter with you, I guess, is uh, one, one question I would have. But you know, we fight fires, right? Because if we're not working, the bad guys are working. And I'll call them guys, even though I'm not being gender specific from that standpoint. They could certainly be gals as well. Uh, but you know, they're attacking us all the time. We come in, there are certainly going to be fires to deal with because you know, they're kind of picking at our stuff every day. So we fight some fires. Um, you know, some days that takes until 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Other days you don't get all that stuff done. Some days you know, you're able to fight the fires more effectively. But then you get to sit down with your boss and get ruined for the last audit. Why? Well, because that's what they do, right? The audit findings come in and the auditors have to prove their worth, so they're going to find something, and when they find something, your boss is going to take you to task for that. That's just the way it works. It's okay, you go in, it's your ritual humiliation. It happens anywhere from one to four times a year. You just kind of grin, grin and bear it and figure, you know, I'll be done with my initiation in uh, you know, a couple hours and, and life will be good after that. Then we'll fight some more fires because while you were getting reamed, the bad guys were still attacking your stuff. So there's more fires to fight from that standpoint. Then we get to grovel for budget and resources. Did anybody come in at the beginning of this year and your boss said, you got, you're doing such a great job, I'm going to double the amount of money we're spending on security and I'm going to double your headcount. That happened anybody? Yeah? No? I've yet to have anybody say, so there's always one wise ass in the back of the room like you. <laughs> Who says, oh, no, no, that happened to me. Well, it turns out that, you know, this guy, you know, just it really happened to me. I was sitting, he worked for a college, and his security team went from one to three. So he actually tripled the amount of resources uh, that he had to protect, like, 50,000 people. And I'm just like, okay, man, uh, that's great. But, you know, a lot of it is just about, and I, I call it groveling, you know, kind of jokingly, but... The reality is it's not much different than that because until we can actually figure out how to build a real value around what it is that we do, it's very hard to turn around and say this is why we should invest in this stuff. Then we get to clean up after the stupid user. Um, I assume, I know I work for myself, there are probably a couple of other folks that uh, work for themselves and I still have stupid users. Right? I, I happen to be the stupid user, but I am certainly stupid and I do stupid things because I play around with stuff. But if you have employees, they're going to do stupid things. That means you'll spend some time cleaning up after them, regardless of how much time you spend educating them, <laughs> regardless of how many defenses you put around them. It's always involved in terms of cleaning these folks up. You'll fill out a silly report. Why? Because the CFO needs to see something. Right? You know, he or she sees a line item that says security stuff, or maybe it's compliance stuff, maybe it's something else, but you know, it's not small. So they turn around and say, well, what did we spend on that? Uh, uh, well, here's a little secret, my little present to you guys today. Put together a spreadsheet and generate some graphs with lots of colors on them. The CFOs love graphs with colors. Rafi's going to talk all about, is it Friday, or is it uh, Friday? Friday, Rafi's going to talk about visualization. That is the key to success as being a, uh, a security professional. If you can put together graphs with lots of colors and bar charts and a couple of pie charts, the CFO looks and says, oh, great. I mean, you know, they got a lot of stuff to do, like buy other companies and figure out how they're going to reduce headcount 40%. You know, they're not really concerned about what it is you're spending the money on. They just want to know that there's actually, you know, something that you're spending the money on. So graphs. Uh, we'll fight yet another fire. Then we get to learn about the application that is going live tomorrow. That ever happened to anybody? You get a phone call from, you know, the head of development says, we, we really need to sit down. Now, how about next Wednesday? No, today. Um, I'm sorry, I'm fighting fires. I'm cleaning up after stupid users. I got to spend some time, you know, doing a silly report. I really don't have time to meet with you. And then they say, well, that's fine because we're actually releasing an application that's going to go to our 10 million users at 12.01 today. So, you know, kind of tonight. So, you know, you can sit down with me and we can figure out what this thing is doing or you can basically clean up the nuclear wasteland that's going to result once this thing goes live. And obviously the engineers don't get that it will be a nuclear wasteland, but that's what goes through your mind once you figure that out. And why is that? That's really a symptom of not being involved in the conversation. It's a symptom of not being involved in the conversation. Then if you're anything like me, you go home and you have a stiff drink. And I'm not sitting here saying, you know, that's the answer to everything, but it certainly works for me, right? You know, after a tough day, you know, my day is tough, right? You know, oh, God, I sat in Starbucks all day and wrote some stuff. It was 
horribly terrible. Um, you know, or you know, you kind of had to deal with travel and you know, dealt with a hostile crowd. I mean, listen, it's not, it's not all this analyst work is not all you know, kind of roses here. Uh, but you, you know, again, it's hard. So you go down, you wind down, you have your drink, you know, you're mellowed out, you know, hopefully you kind of spend some good time with the people that matter to you, and then you end up going to bed, but in the back of your mind, there's always that thought, I hope the beeper doesn't go off at 3 a.m. And 3 a.m. is just kind of like that universal time. Why don't the bad guys attack at 10 a.m.? Why, why don't they launch their big attack after you've kind of had time to go in, fight a couple of the fires, amazingly enough, right about the time you're, you're going to get reamed, which is usually scheduled for about 10 o'clock. Uh, it would be wonderful if they launched the attack and then I could, you know, deal with it then. But no, 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 those guys, they have to do it at 3 a.m. So you have to get up in the middle of the night. You have to go and clean up the mess. Uh, and is it any wonder that most of the security professionals that I deal with tend to be pretty freaking grumpy? It's a hard job. You know, it's funny, I actually gave a version of this pitch um, uh, in Europe today, and I was horrified because I put this slide up, and I'm like, do these people even know who Grumpy is? <laughs> but I said, do you guys know who Grumpy is? And they said, yeah, yeah, we, you know, it's Europe. It's not, you know, third world country. It's not, you know, so. Sorry, Raph. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, 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 you're a Disney, they have? All right, cool. So, uh, so, I mean, it's hard, right? You know, being a security professional is hard from that standpoint. Now here, this is how security professionals tend to view audits. Like a 15 round fight or root canal or use whatever you know, fancy analogy you have. But historically, it's been very, very acrimonious. Very difficult situation. Why? Because security folks are on all the time. Right? We don't get to take breaks. The bad guys don't get to take breaks. It's kind of this whole mentality of good versus evil. Well, anybody that's telling you you're kind of not doing stuff exactly correct, well, that's the evil side of the coin. And the coin only has two, two faces, right? So you're either with me or you're against me. And in most cases, a lot of the security people have historically kind of said the auditors are against them. And that, again, is a very challenging way to go through the day. It's a very challenging way to go through the day. You know, again, I talk to a lot of these folks, and you know, it, it's actually funny because you speak to both sides, and I've done a lot of pictures for auditors too, and it's amazing to get their perspective on it. But you know, most of the security folks sit there and say, the auditors just don't get it. I sit there and I walk them through what I'm doing, and they just don't understand where I'm coming from. They don't understand why I'm doing these things. They just don't understand, and I just don't have the time to teach them. So I fight with them, I bury them in all sorts of, you know, kind of documentation. You know, hey, how are you? Here's the log files for the last 10 years. Have fun, Mr. or Ms. Auditor, at $300 an hour, uh, or whatever it is that you're paying the external guys to be in there. Um, so it's hard. It's always been hard to deal with the auditors from that standpoint. Real question, why can't we all get along? I'm a big fan of Kumbaya. Right? If anybody knew me back when I had a marketing job, I was the anti-Kumbaya guy. I really was. It was all about me, I win, you lose, you know, very type A, very uh, unbridled, uh, aggressive type stuff. It's a new mic. It's a new mic. Imagine what I used to be like if this is the Kumbaya mic. So uh, get it from, uh, from that standpoint. So before we kind of jump into, you know, kind of an approach that I think is indicative of the way security should be done, I, I always like to take a step back and talk about the reasons to secure. And to me, this is what it's all about. This is why we do security. Your job is to protect the assets of the organization and ensure business can operate. I did not say configure the firewalls. I didn't say make sure we're patching within, you know, kind of a window of four hours. I certainly didn't say, um, you know, kind of ensure that we're encrypted with full disk encryption on every laptop that goes out there. You know what? Your CEO doesn't care about those things. Your CEO cares about two things that are up there, that the assets of your organization are protected and that your business can operate. So I broke that into five different kind of imperatives, and I think those imperatives are actually kind of important because I've looked at this problem from a prism of maybe a hundred different ways, and they all come back to these five things. Maintain business system availability. I didn't say network availability. I didn't say data center availability. I didn't say even application availability. I said business systems, because business systems are actually indicative of automated business processes. So that's the way you have to think about things. Not from the standpoint of, hey, my router is down, I'm hosed. Well, you know what? Through the wonders of IP, which was uh, you know, basically architected in the 70s and is still pretty relevant today, you can sort of route around some of those problems. But your system that ships stuff to your customers goes down, that's a bad day. That's a bad day. 
So you got to make sure the business systems are up and running. Protect intellectual property. You know, it's funny. You know, as I've kind of gone through this business over over 15 years, you know, there were varying levels where this was an issue for some organizations. Nowadays, I feel very comfortable saying, I don't care what business you're in, I don't care who you work for, most if not all of the important stuff that you have from an intellectual property standpoint is digitized. So what does that mean? It means somebody can basically drag it onto an iPod. iPod's wonderful, man. You know, how else do you burn up a 12-hour flight somewhere without having, you know, your wonderful, you know, music with you, right? Unfortunately, with an 80 gig drive, you can do a lot of damage. Your whole customer database probably is in 80 gigs. So again, just totally changes the whole mentality of how we have to protect that intellectual property. We can drag that not just to an iPod, but pop it into email and send it anywhere. Again, hey, I wanted to do some work at home, so I sent that spreadsheet to my Gmail account. It happens every single day. We gotta protect the intellectual property. Limit corporate liability. I, I spent some time in the anti-spam business, so that was a, a no-brainer, right? Somebody would get a message that you know, kind of made people squeamish, and two days later, the lawyer letter would show up. Hostile work environment. There was no easier way to overcome any barriers to sale than a lawyer letter saying hostile work environment. They don't care what it costs, they gotta fix the problem. Gotta limit the corporate liability. Safeguard the corporate brand. Anybody work for TJX here? I'm in Boston, so I will ask the question. Anybody? No? Good, let's make fun of them. Um, <laughs> anybody sell products to TJX? then you'll get pissed off if I make fun of them. Um, you know, again, I feel for the outgoing CEO, notice I said outgoing CEO uh, of TJX, uh, because this guy had to get on national TV and basically say, I'm a schmuck. Sorry, I'm a schmuck. I lost your, you know, I lost your data. I feel bad. Oh, by the way, my margins are like 2%, so I'm not even going to give you credit monitoring until there was like a total, you know, kind of conniption from everybody. So they said, okay, I'll give you some, you know, credit monitoring. But the reality is, it's been problematic. Right, you know, that brand issue is, is really an issue. What about, you know, kind of, anybody from the UK here? I just may as well ask, try to get a feel for everybody here. You know, the government there lost information about pretty much every citizen. Not once, twice, in the space of about a week. Right, so, you know, this stuff is happening every day. It impacts how people view whatever organization you're in. It really does. And then finally, we have to ensure compliance, and if only just to get the rubber stamp, because if we don't get that rubber stamp, the auditors can certainly make life miserable for us. Now, let's talk a little bit about confusion. You know, we've been through, how many folks have been in this business for, you know, more than 10 years? Almost everybody, that's outstanding. Uh, so you've been through this movie, you've seen all this stuff, you've seen the patterns before. First it was HIPAA, right? Talk about an empty suit, that one is. Remember? Everybody was, oh, it, bedlam, HIPAA, oh my God, HIPAA, HIPAA, HIPAA. What happened? I think there's been a total of five enforcement actions in HIPAA in like 10 years. I mean, what happened? Then, then we had Sarbanes-Oxley. What does that even mean? We have to have strong financial controls. Well, I mean, how do you know they're strong? Well, you'll know it when you see it. Uh, okay, that one's pretty easy to, you know, kind of get my arms around what that means. You know, now we have PCI. And to the credit, no pun intended, um, you know, to the credit of the credit card folks that put PCI in place. Uh, basically, it's a lot more specific than anything we've ever dealt with before. So it's broken into basically 12 requirements that you have to do these things. They don't say exactly how to do it, but they say, here's what you should be doing. That's great, because if you compare that to HIPAA, which says, like, do a vulnerability scan, uh, you know, come on, just totally different. And you know what, tomorrow there'll be something else, especially if Richard Clark has his way, right? You, you know, there'll be more compliance. Yeah, go ahead. To, yep, notification, you bet, you bet. So there's all sorts of other things. There, there'll always be something. So the good news for security people is that we'll always have some regulation that we have to deal with. The bad news for security people is that the lazy ones use that as kind of the metaphor for everything that they do. They use it as a metaphor for everything that they do. Uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about vendor FUD. Just because, you know, again, I can. So I, I can call this stuff out because I can. Um, many of the vendors will come there, and do you love the press releases that say, easy PCI, easy regulation to be named later. What the hell is easy about PCI? There are 12 requirements. If you haven't started, it's literally like going through the seven rings of fire. If you have not started, if you have your security in, in decent place, well, then it's probably not too bad. But easy, no, there's nothing easy about it. Um, and again, not so much from, from an easy standpoint. What does compliance mean? Well, here, I have a couple of things. Compliance is arbitrary nebulous in the eyes of the examiner, and this is a great one, right? So you do all this work, you know, it's basically your life's work for, you know, certainly a year, and the auditor shows up and has a different opinion 
about what secure applications mean than you do. Guess who's the schmuck after that, you know, fi report of findings comes up? It ain't the auditor. It ain't the auditor. Nebulous. Totally subjective. Big problems. Not really enforced, but the good news is if you work for a public company, your board knows all about compliance because they've had the outside counsel, not at $300 an hour that the external auditors kind of charge you, but at $800 or $900 an hour to do an assessment of how at risk the board of directors is to things like Sarbanes-Oxley. Because they all saw the perp walk. They all get their Christmas cards from Bernie Ebers and Dennis Kozlowski. Um, you know, because again, those guys don't have a lot to do, so they send a lot of Christmas cards. A lot of Christmas cards. Um, from that standpoint, and they don't want to end up like that. Compliance is not something you buy. You don't go down to Best Buy, maybe get a picture frame or something like that, as uh, Richard Clark said. Uh, you don't go down to Best Buy and say, "I'll buy a compliance." Can you pop it into the back of my Expedition? It's big. Just put the pallet right into the expedition. No, 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 you don't buy it. It's not something you finish. Anybody not roll out anything new this year? Your business has been totally static. You have not done anything new. You haven't fired anybody. You haven't hired anybody. You haven't rolled out anything. You haven't brought on any new customers. You haven't shipped one thing. Anybody that? Yeah? Then maybe you could be finished with compliance. But once you add that one employee, all hell breaks, out. All hell breaks loose. It's a dynamic world. We certainly are never finished. And it's also not something you can ignore. So two schools of thought. One is, and I, you know, I hear this all the time, so I'll, I'll sit down with somebody and say, well, what are your big projects for this year? PCI. What does that mean? I'm going to get PCI compliant. Well, how do you do that? Well, there are 12 requirements, and they start explaining PCI to me. I mean, that's a, that's a riot when I, when I sit down, and uh, that stuff happens. You know, again, because these people really think that if they sit here and say, my big goal in life this year is to get PCI compliant, that that is going to help them be secure. I'm tipping my hand already. I believe, inherently, since I don't know what the next one is going to be, maybe it's 1386 on a federal level, maybe it's something else, maybe it's secure coding standards, maybe it's you know, the ISPs, I mean, it could be anything. So sitting here and building a security strategy around a specific regulation <coughs> is a fool's errand. It's a fool's errand. We think about security first. That's one of the hallmarks of what it is that I do. Think security, compliance works itself out most of the time. Again, you'll get a difficult auditor, you'll get you know, all sorts of different issues, you maybe have a breach, God forbid, but you know, it does happen to, to some folks. Uh, and then you, you, know, you kind of clean up the mess from, from that perspective. But the reality is, if you think security, if you do security well, then I believe compliance does fall into place. That being said, uh, how many folks have line items that say compliance? Anybody have line items? Anybody awake? Yeah, a couple? More coffee in the back. Um, so this is kind of where some people get confused about what I say. Well, you say, you, God, you hate compliance, yet you say, go get a compliance, you, you know, go, go loot the compliance money. Well, hey, if you guys have money in compliance, loot it. Take it. Figure it out. If there's still a line item that says, I, I, you know, I'm going to spend money on compliance, shame on you if you don't figure out how to use that for the things that you think are important to your security posture. Again, different kind of mentality. There's the mentality of getting things paid for, and then there's the mentality of doing things. I think from a doing things standpoint, we think about security. I think from a paying, thing, paying funding standpoint, we do whatever's necessary. If that means we can actually get it done via looting the compliance budget, hey, bully for you. That's outstanding. Yes. $4,300 an hour, a night, I guess. I don't know. I, I don't, I, that was a total non sequitur, but I'm still so shocked by that number. I have to, I have to say that. It was, it was impressive. So, Pragmatic CSO, a simple, focused, and achievable program to put you back in control of your security program. Uh, so, what is the Pragmatic CSO? And then I'll kind of go through the methodology. Well, I know it's shocking to, to hear, but I've named the main character of the book Mike. I know. It's hard. Uh, you, um, I know you're all shocked that uh, a megalomaniac like me would name a character in his book after himself. Yes, I did that. Uh, so Mike has joined this group called Security Products Anonymous, because in my, in my main uh, pragmatic CSO pitch, I kind of go through this whole thing about how we're addicted to the battle. We're addicted to dysfunction. We're addicted to kind of the whole good versus evil. We're addicted to throwing products at our problems as opposed to taking a step back and figuring out how to actually solve the root cause of the issue as opposed to throwing a box with flashing lights and a, and a shiny bezel, uh, a, a, you know, kind of against the problem from that standpoint. So I have this whole construct that Mike goes through this 12-step program because he's addicted. So it's a 12-step program where he goes and basically goes through these steps of his journey. 
So here's the methodology. I've got some handouts somewhere uh, around here if anybody's interested. Uh, but we'll kind of go through these in turn. Step one, section one is planning. I'm not a big planner. <laughs> I know you're all shocked to hear that. I, I would much rather do than plan, but you know that old adage, uh, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, blah, 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 blah. So what does that mean to me? You know, where, where am I going to spend my time planning? Well, I'm going to do a couple things. First thing I'm going to do is sit down with my executives, and that is step one. I sit down with a lot of people, I say, what is the single most important application or business system or anything in your environment? And they go, blah, blah, blah. you know, they stammer a little bit, they go into some convulsions, I'll know whether they're lying to me, and then they'll blurt something out, and I'll say, you're wrong. And they'll say, what do you mean I'm wrong? You don't know anything about my environment. I say, you're wrong. And then they'll look at me funny and go, after the initial shock wears off, um, and then they'll go, well, how do you know I'm wrong? I said, because it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you think is the most important thing in your environment. The only thing that matters is what they think is important. So if you don't get out from behind your desk and go ask the people who write checks and sell things and run your business what they think is important, you don't really know. So that's what step one is all about. Step two, baseline. And how do you know where you're going if you don't know where you are? And be very candid. I know a lot of people that run baselines. Maybe it's a vulnerability scan. Maybe it's a pen test. Maybe it's a survey. And they don't really want to know the answers. The bad guys don't care what your answers are. The bad guys will break your stuff. And when the bad guys break your stuff, if you don't know where you're at, you're kind of really hosed. So be candid in your baseline. Don't you know, kind of sit here and think that you're going to make yourself look bad by kind of saying, we've got these issues. Because I'll tell you what, you can't lie to the bad guys. The bad guys know, because they're on the other end of a keyboard in Chechnya. And they don't care. They don't care. Manage expectations. That is the single thing that security professionals screw up most often. We like to say yes. And when somebody says, we're going to cut your budget 25% and you, know, you can't replace those two professionals that went to go do something else, and you go, no problem. No problem? Anybody get through their list every day? Yeah? Everybody? So when they say we're reducing your resources, most people's conditioned response is to say, Okay, sir, thank you. May I have another? And then they go and bitch to their wife or yell at the dog or, you know, kind of drown their sorrows with a, you know, honey latte uh, or whatever the latest thing from Starbucks is uh, from that standpoint. But, you know, the right answer after you go through the baseline, after you figure out what's important is to sit and say, here's where we're at. Here are the two gaping holes that somebody could literally drive a Mack truck through. We've got a choice. We could fix them and here's what it's going to cost. Or we could ignore it and here's what's going to happen. But if you don't say that first, you got no leg to stand on when somebody drives a Mack truck through your thing. You got no leg to stand on. Oh, by the way, you probably don't have a leg to stand on anyway. Because, you know, if the thing goes down, guess who's going to get, you know, thrown out of the car at a high rate of speed? You or the CEO or the CIO? I, I, I know the answer to that. and you, you probably do also. But at least you feel better that you've made the point that we're at risk. Here's what we have to do. So that's all about managing expectations. Then we build a security, a pragmatic security environment. First thing is a security business plan. Again, didn't say detailed design, didn't say architecture, didn't say shopping list, said business plan. Security people don't view their operation as a business. We don't have milestones, we don't set expectations, we don't have accountabilities to say, this is what we're going to do, this is my plan, this is what I'm going to spend, and this is why I'm going to do it. So the first thing we do is build a business plan. Why are we protecting the stuff? Go back to the reasons to secure and use examples from your stuff. We're trying to protect our own intellectual property. Well, what kind of intellectual property? And go and use you know, examples from your own world. That's how we do that. Um, then you know, we kind of break that down into what it looks like to get a couple of different layers of uh, levels of security. One is security where you feel pretty good about the fact that you're in decent shape. Then you've got kind of the other extreme, which is, well, if I can't do this stuff, I'm kind of praying every day that my number doesn't go up, right? You know, my number doesn't come up. I'm not going to get hosed. I'm not going to have that big data breach in the sky. I'm not going to be, you know, that poor dude from Ohio University. I may remember that one. I actually met that guy, the guy, right? I was in Columbus, and, you know, I sit down with a meeting. I had no idea who this guy was. And he says, oh, so what's your background? I said, oh, I'm working for this company. And I said, oh, where were you before that? He goes, oh, you know, a little place called Ohio University. You may remember that. These were the guys that basically lost all of their students' information, not once, but twice, within like a two-month period. Like, you know, alumni were you know, just ravenous. Pulled big, you know, donations, endowments. I mean, it was a real mess, and I met the guy. 
right? The guy got thrown under the bus because the CIO, who wouldn't take the action that the security guy was telling him to do, got thrown under the bus. So I felt good that this guy actually found another job and was able to, you know, kind of move on. But it's very instructive, very instructive from that standpoint. We've got to sell the story. Once we've got those levels of investment that we know, we have to sell. Now, does that mean you go and buy a Mount Block pen, you slick your hair back, buy a Rolex, kind of sit down and say, what are you going to buy today? What are you going to buy today? No. But you're talking to your people. But again, if we all don't think we're in sales, we all don't understand how the world works anymore. We've got to sell something. We're selling the idea to our developers that they should be thinking about things securely. We're selling to our network guys why it would be a very bad idea to deploy WEP for a thousand retail stores. We're selling the data center guys on what this new virtualization means from a security standpoint. And if you have the answer to that, please tell me. I have no idea what it means, but Chris does. Um, but we're selling them on something because they're going to need to think about this. And the job of the CSO today is much more about persuasion than it is about actually doing things and having an empire. If you want an empire, security is the wrong place to be. If you want to kind of work with folks and persuade and you know, kind of work from that standpoint, great position. Then we've got to buy things. Hard to buy things. I have a structured pro process for how we should buy things. Then we've got to run the organization pragmatically, operations and, and monitoring. I, I love this. It, you know, I, I really remember the old, uh, I guess it was ISS, now IBM. Uh, you know, their old tagline, we're going to help you get ahead of the threat. Anybody ahead of the threat? You're ahead of it? Yeah? No? I love that. I'm like, man, if these guys are ahead of the threat, they're in the wrong business. They should be doing stock arbitrage. Because I'll tell you, that pays a hell of a lot better than selling friggin' IBS boxes. A hell of a lot better. So they're ahead of the threat, and they have a crystal ball. They are applying it incorrectly. You can't get ahead of the threat. So I have this whole doctrine I call react faster. What does that mean? It means you monitor a lot of your stuff. Networks, applications, databases, monitor. Look for anomalous activity. Look for things that are out of the norm. Like Mike Rothman starts sending 10,000 emails in an hour. Mike Rothman types pretty fast. I've been typing since eighth grade. You know, touch typing. It's amazing how fast I can type. 10,000 emails in an hour would be a lot, even for me. So odds are somebody has taken over my machine and it's bad stuff is going on if I'm starting to stream out those things. Or if I'm attacking places like E-Trade. Again, that's uncharacteristic. Uncharacteristic. So operations and monitoring, I think, is one of the keys to success. Default deny is another thing I talk about in the process, which is if you don't specifically allow it, Disallow it? Not too hard. Step eight, contain the problem. Um, if you've been doing security for any length of time, odds are you've had a problem. An incident, whatever you want to call it. If you haven't, go leave the room right now. Do not wait. Leave the room right now and go play the lottery because you are unbelievably lucky and your number will come up. So the difference between the borderline hero and the absolute goat when you have an incident is how you deal with that incident. So make sure you have a very defined incident response plan, business continuity, whatever you want to call it, and make sure you practice it. A lot of people have a thing, it sits in their desk, maybe it's a Word file or something like that, they never look at it, they never do much of anything with it, and then, you know, kind of the brown stuff hits the fan, and guess what? Nobody knows what the hell to do, and things go off the, ra off the rails, and it's a friggin' train wreck. And why? Because these folks don't realize it doesn't matter if you've been an exemplary professional for 15 years. You bum, again, the Ohio University guy, or the TJX people, or, you know, the folks in the UK that, you know, kind of had all those data breaches. Those folks are thrown out of the car at a high rate of speed. Somebody's got to pay. Somebody's got to pay. But if you can turn around and make that into a learning experience, and by learning experience, I mean you get to keep your job, right, learning experience, you can live to fight another day. That's pretty important. I'm still a fan of user awareness training. It's very hard. It's very thankless. Stupid people still do stupid things. A lot of people want to give up. They think it's a waste of time. I would much rather buy something shiny with flashing lights and a nice bezel than spend some time telling people what is right and what is wrong. Like, if you don't have an account at Citibank and you get an email that says, change your information on Citibank, guess what? It's probably not for you. It, again, it doesn't have to be hard, but it has to be consistent. 
You have to educate your people consistently. That's the only way to do this stuff. And then step 10 is about assurance. What does that mean? It means testing. I'm a big fan of penetration testing. I know some big pundits, you know, folks that invented things like um, the firewall and stuff, don't think pen testing is, is worth a damn. I, I think they're wrong. Because I'll tell you what, the bad guys are testing your defenses every single day. That's all they do is test your defenses. If you don't know what they're going to find, you've got a big problem. Because the other thing I hate are surprises. Anybody like surprises? Surprise! You have a party, 50 of your best friends are sitting in the room. That's not the kind of surprise you get as a security professional, now is it? Surprise! Here's the HR person telling you what your package is going to be after you've screwed something up. <laughs> That's a surprise. That's not the kind of surprise that I think we all want to get. So again, practice your stuff, test your defenses, break your things. If you're a company of size, I believe you should have people whose job it is to break stuff, which again, I think would be a great job. What do you do? I break things. With like a hammer? Sort of. Like that's end users. What's that? That's end users. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but I mean people that are actually trying to do things sort of maliciously. End users, you know, and it's just funny because, right, how many folks use outbound spam filtering? So you're actually looking at things that go out. A couple, the rest of you are numbed into submission. That, that actually happens. About 35 minutes in, people are just like, Make it stop, make it stop. This is, this is like from college. I, I, I just, if I throw up, it'll be, oh, it'll be great, it'll be great. Um, it, you know, so from that standpoint, when you get to the point where you have folks that are actually maliciously trying to replicate what the bad guys are going to do, you learn a whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of stuff. And I think that's very important because you're going to roll these things out into the world and the bad guys are going to do these things and maybe they're automated, maybe they're not automated, but if you don't know what they're going to find, you are not prepared to deal with anything. Section four, communicate your value, benchmark uh, your progress. We'll talk a little bit about that. There's metrics. I know Dan uh, Gear is going to talk all about metrics. There's another section on Friday on, on metrics, uh, session on Friday. Um, and again, I think metrics are important. I still don't have a good answer for what it is that we should be counting, but I think we should be counting something. If anybody has any great ideas, I'm starting to uh, initiate a, a process to help that out. Um, but, you know, if we could, in a perfect world, be able to compare what it is that we do to what other folks are doing, life would get a lot easier from that standpoint. And then there's step 12, which is compliance. We'll talk a lot about that, you know, in the next uh, couple of slides. But I believe, again, compliance is step 12. Compliance is the last thing you worry about because if you do all those other things pretty okay, you're in pretty good shape when it comes to compliance. So good security equals compliance. I believe that. Treat your auditor as a peer. We'll talk about that. And then painless audits. So the auditor is your friend. Okay. Am I telling you to go and, like, hang out socially with your auditor? No. I'm not doing that. They're very exciting people, very good at Parcheesi and other n numbers oriented games. Um, they could certainly, if you need to figure out how much to tip the person at dinner, auditors are wonderful companions from, uh, from, from that standpoint. Um, I'm just kind of being a little facetious uh, from that standpoint. But you know, the reality is the auditor can make your life miserable. If you are acrimonious with the auditor, the findings will reflect that and you will end up spending more than your share of time getting reamed about the audit findings. Treat them as peers, treat them with respect. Oh, by the way, here's another thing about auditors that you may not know. They probably know more than you. What? Auditors know more than me? I know everything. Well, here's what you don't do. Some of you may do this. Most of you don't spend a week or two in a different environment every week or two. These folks see an awful lot of stuff. They see stuff, you know, and they see train wrecks that you are so glad is not you. It's unbelievable. You can actually learn from these folks. Learn from these folks. The auditor's goal is the same as yours. A lot of people think they're here to make me look bad. No. They're there to make sure that your information is protected. We're on the same team. Again, you could either look at it as a positive type of situation where you can learn from them, or it's a negative kind of situation where they're trying to make me look bad. The choice is yours. The pragmatic auditor. Show them that you're in control. Provide an overview of the process. Again, that's what these folks want. I don't know any, well, okay, I do know some auditors that want to do this, but you know, most auditors don't want to sit and wade through your log files. They just don't. What they want to know is that you're in control. They want to know that there's a program in place, we're working this, we have accountabilities, we have serious action happening in our security program. And then you prove it to them. 
You show them a couple things. You talk to them about what it is that you're doing. You show them the entirety of your program. Maybe you talk a little bit about an incident that you had. What? Tell the auditor we had an incident? They're going to look, they're going to think we're going to, they think we're nincompoops. No. By the way, if they look through all your logs, they know you've had an incident. Go ahead, yeah. You bet. Outside, outside of the organization? Yeah. yeah. Or you just get, uh, I spent several years with a pension fund, and it was always the same thing. It was an experienced auditor and three rookies for training. Okay. They come in and run IS a scanner and hang your report and never even yep. fix the problem. Really. Yep. So th there's this concept I, I have that I call the credibility bank, right? So everybody comes in and basically you have no credibility. And then when you kind of do things and you basically do what you say you're going to do and show a history of, you know, kind of doing that and having a modicum of success, you get to deposit in the credibility bank. And when to the degree that you actually have, you know, some assets in the credibility bank, you can go to your boss and say, you understand these auditors are nincompoops? And, you know, I, I know the one guy that we pay $400 an hour to is worth it. And the other guys that we pay $300 an hour to is not. But if you don't have credibility, you don't get to have that kind of conversation. And again, you know, part of the process, again, this is an optimal process, right? Part of being a security professional is adapting to whatever situation is in front of you. And the reality is you're going to get some folks, and we'll talk about it on the next slide, which is all about documentation, that actually want to go through your firewall logs. What are they possibly going to learn? It said it in the audit checkbook, right? That's the other thing about auditors. If you need somebody to make you a list, with nice little check boxes next to it that you can just check. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful people, wonderful people. Run them through an incident post-mortem, show appropriate documentation. What does that actually mean? Again, there are some auditors that want to see that level of detail. Guess what? They're not gonna settle for, why do you wanna see that? Give it to them. It, it takes the discussion in a totally different path. It's a waste of your time buy a roll of Tums and expense it to your company? Seriously. And they'll say, well, wh what are the Tums for? Those nincompoop auditors that made me sit and walk through the firewall logs for you know, a week and a half while I should have been doing other things? It's all part of the game. But as you're able to make that case, as you're able to build credibility within your organization, you get to start. It's amazing how senior auditors realize when they're dealing with somebody on the other side that's been through a number of different audit processes, how their whole demeanor changes. You're either running the audit or they're running the audit. If you go in there and kind of say, this is kind of what we want to show you, our program and kind of what it is that we do and our control sets and substantiate that we've got these things and we've had a mistake and here's the things we did to make sure that that mistake doesn't happen again, what, what can they say? I want to look at your firewall logs. Well, that's great. I have work to do. because so I've showed you exactly what I do and why I do it. So then you can actually kind of get to being more productive and let them bill your company at however many hundreds of dollars an hour they're going to do that. Um, the reality is you have to come prepared to the audit. So again, you don't know who's going to be the other person. You don't know. So you have to have all this documentation in place. How to get started, again, pragmaticcso.com. Summary, security first. Compliance can be a funding source. Again, if the money's there, go get the money. I don't have any issue with that. Get the money. The auditor is your friend. And ultimately, if they are annoying and won't take no for an answer, give them what it is that they want. Thank you. Questions? Hi. I didn't realize I was being photoed here. Anything? You're numb, beaten into submission. Wish I would go away. Go ahead, Matt. So, I mean, I think you went through a bunch of these, Mike, but what is, you know, the most common mistake that you see CISOs making in terms of approaching compliance? I mean, from a high level, clearly, it's, you know, going after the checkboxes. Yep. The big ones? Uh, the, the big one, I, I would say that the big one is thinking that the simple things that you do, like antivirus and patching and, you know, kind of vulnerability scans, are actually what it means to be compliant. Again, they don't think about it from a security standpoint. They tend not to think about it from a risk management standpoint. So, again, they're all about checking the boxes as opposed to protecting the information, which is fundamentally what it is that we have to do. So, you know, that's kind of a nutshell in terms of, you know, what I think is one of the big you know, issues. I mean, there are probably a number of different minor ones, but in terms of real strategic problems, folks think that, hey, once I get that audit and it says I'm cool from a PCI standpoint, they think they're done, and the bad guys tell them that they're not. Yeah, just your, your, your quick thoughts on the dichotomy of when you're running a business, you have a product, products do certain things, right? 
problem with security is am I secure today? Let me check. Will I be secure tomorrow? I don't know. Probably not. Right. So given that dichotomy, what are your thoughts about selling security as a business when you can't offer any guarantees? Um, that's a good question. You know, how do, how do you kind of talk about security when there is no guarantee? Um, I don't think we have any guarantees. So your salesperson, you work for a company, whatever it is, you have somebody selling something, they say, I'm going to make my number or I'm not going to make my number. There's no guarantees for that. Stuff happens. Now, where the kind of rubber meets the road, especially relative to the whole program, gets down to showing the logic in what you're doing and why you're doing it. Right? Again, you know, and, and logic to a senior level audience is much different than the logic you're going to get when you deal with a bunch of bit jockeys that are configuring you know, routers. You've got to tune your message to, to those audiences. But when, when you're in that senior level thing, here's how we think about security. And that's what kind of talking about the whole program is about, how you, know, you manage your expectations along those lines. And you say very specifically, there is no 100% security. There is none. It, it, it does not exist. We could literally pay a billion dollars and we would not be secure. And then they say, well, why do we spend anything? Well, then you have the other answer in your back pocket, which is, you know, I can tell you what will happen if we spend nothing. I can also tell you what will happen if we spend a billion dollars and you're not a billion dollar type of organization. It's really in the middle where the rubber meets the road. Again, you got to make, I wouldn't say a business case because it's hard to make a business case. But it has to be relevant to the business. We have to think about security and make it relevant to the business people. And things like downtime, things like brand damage, things like, uh, again, intellectual property, these are things that senior business people respond to. Because they understand. You know, one question I love to ask, you know, where I, I love to have kind of my, my clients kind of ask this to, to their folks. If this thing breaks, who gets fired? That's a very simple way to distill how important that thing is. Logistic system goes down, who gets fired? If you're talking to the CRO, he says, me. And you say, hmm, I would assume that's pretty important to you. And he or she will say, yes. Great. You know, one of the, here Matt, one more thing. The biggest mistake, another big mistake that people make is they treat security equally. So they treat everything that they do equally. That means for the old, 3270 terminal emulation application that, you know, five users are, uh, you know, beating on every day. They put the same level of angst, put the same level of cycles behind that as they do against the online application where every single one of their customers is getting their information every day. Security folks don't know how to kind of say, that's not that important. So what's the worst thing that can happen if, you know, the 3270 terminal application gets hosed, right? Whereas... It's pretty clear what would happen if that very important application that every customer goes through gets hosed. So that's another huge error that people make. You really have to, again, that's what step one is all about. What is important? Who's going to get fired? And then you can figure out where you should spend your money. Because guess what? When I talked about building that business plan, you've got a couple of different scenarios in there. One is, hey, I feel good about my ability to do my job. The other is, man, this thing is an accident waiting to happen. If I only get this level of funding, I should probably dust off my resume. And then there's somewhere in the middle, which is reality. But part of the whole process is managing expectations to say, if you give me only this amount, I can't do this other stuff. So here are a couple of things that may happen. Not chicken little time, but being honest. Because if you don't communicate that, when it does happen, again, you're thrown out of the car at a high rate of speed. And unless you have a leather suit on and a helmet, it hurts a lot. Other questions, comments? Yeah, on the back. The next? You mean after the one that we're in now? Uh, so, so the question is, what happens in an economic downturn? Uh, nobody wins in an economic downturn, right? Actually, and, and I would very strongly dispute the fact that security budgets are protected right? They're protected in a downturn. I'll tell you what happened. You know what's protected? The application that's going to help you sell a lot more stuff to your customers. That is protected. You have people that are forward-thinking CEOs that say, I'm actually going to invest 
through this downturn, they're not investing in security. They're investing in things that are going to help transform their business when the economy does start peaking back up, and it always does. It's cyclical. They want to be in a better position to be able to sell more stuff to their customers. I, I believe security, and you know, it's funny. I haven't heard any of this stuff. I talked to a lot of people in the field. I talked to a lot of people kind of in the customers, and they said, oh, budgets are solid, budgets are solid, budgets are solid until March 25th. Because that's when the salespeople that work for the vendors go to the customers and say, I need this order by the 31st. No problem. And then the 26th. No problem. Then the 27th. No problem. Then the 28th. There may be a problem. And then you get to the 31st, we're screwed. Because they don't, you know, until you don't get the money, you don't know that you're not going to get the money. So I, one man's opinion, and I've been wrong, it has happened. My wife will be happy to list <coughs> chapter and verse all the times I've been wrong, just in the last day. Um, a lot of people are saying, you know, security's protected. I, I don't buy it. I, I think, you know, security is going to be shown to be just as uh, exposed to what is an economic downturn, regardless of what the administration is saying here in the United States. Um, what is an economic downturn? I think security is not insulated. Other questions, comments? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so is your question, how do, how do I interface or how do I how do you get the work with? Out of the business units about the importance of information. I've seen a lot of places where um, yeah, they don't know. They do some yeah. sort of classification of information. Yeah. You know, that is the single, that to, to, to me, you know, everybody wants to talk about DLP and everyone wants to talk about all these things that are so important. You know, the reality is the thing in, that, that's really the headwind in DLP today is the organization, it's not a technology thing, right? I mean, these things have been around for five, six years. They actually sort of work, depending on what you want to do. It's the organizational issues that kind of make it very political in terms of what it is that you do, right? So let me paint an example for you. A rainmaker in your organization has a habit for you porn. It could be anything, right? They tend to close three to four million dollar deals every one or two months and you know what, they don't see a problem with doing that stuff at work. They don't see a problem with sending emails around to all their buddies because hey, I saw this thing and it's you know, real interesting. They don't have a problem with that. Well, I'll tell you, the security guy will say, that is unacceptable. I want to hang that dude in the middle of the public square. CIO may even say that too. The guy who has to make his numbers at the end of March and is waiting on that four or five million dollar deal so that your stock doesn't go, you know, poof. They have a little bit of a different opinion about that. So again, a lot of this stuff is wonderful in concept. A lot of it is very hard to do because we have people, we have politics, and we have process that has to enable a lot of these things. So getting back to your question, it was a roundabout way of saying, in many cases, the, business, the businesses don't want to know. They don't want to know what their people do. They don't want to know where the data is. They don't want to know. Because if they know, they have to do something about it. So they enforce plausible deniability, and again, all you can do is make the point. All you can do is make the point. You cannot make them tell you where, your data, where the data is. You cannot hold an anvil over their head and say, you're going to be in trouble if you don't do this and do a wily e. Coyote and drop the thing on their head and they walk around, you know, real small. Can't do it. All you can do is make the point and ask the questions. And if systematically your organization decides to not deal with those things, well, maybe it's time to go find another organization where, you know, kind of information, privacy, and protection is more important. Because I can tell you how that ends up. We, we all know how that, how that ends up. I think we're about done, yeah? I think so. Unless there's one last question. And you're going to answer it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very easy for me. Um, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, guys. If anybody wants a data sheet, I have them uh, up here. Kind of shows the process. You can hang it in your wall, throw darts at it. It's a lot of fun. Makes a great party. Makes a great party favor. Fill out an evaluation form. They're important for us to know who we're going to invite again next year and who's not going to cheat anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, in here.